everybody. Chris Brown here for Murmur and Abiumed. I'm fortunate enough to be joined by my partner, Sid Panache, a uh, structural heart cardiologist, um, always teaching me something new. I heard about this kind of wild and crazy case that he was doing. He's always inventing new things, and I was uh, very fortunate that I was able to convince him, and he's going to kind of walk us through a, a, a new version of, we'll call it protected mitra clip, or we'll figure out a better name. But Sid, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I mean, yeah, I'm always every day humbled uh, working with like great partners like you and you know we've done some great cases and so um uh thanks for this opportunity to present this case um and so uh you know i have this 70 we have known this 77 year old gentleman and uh again humbled by his ex own experience because this guy was like uh, a pillar of health uh, a ski instructor and then landed up in the hospital just a few months ago uh with uh, a non stemmy and uh, found to have uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy with multivessel disease, uh, was actually cathed by me initially, and then uh, ended up with, uh, you know, having left main, uh, just multivessel bad disease. Uh, one of our partner's patients uh, who was planning on doing a PCI, but uh, got referred uh, to CTS, and like, you know, rightly so, uh, also had some moderate MR at that point of time, uh, so the surgeons kind of weighed in whether we should uh, do a combined uh, cabbage and mitral valve versus just do the cabbage itself. Um, so anyways, so he went and went cabbage. They decided not to do his mitral valve repair because his valve actually didn't look as bad on the transesophageal echo and uh, during intra, intra procedural surgical uh, TEE. And so they left it alone. Um, and he was kind of doing okay, uh, went home. Uh, and however, unfortunately, just kind of kept on getting worse over the next month and ended up in the hospital with um, quote unquote cardiogenic shock, uh, kind of picture a little cold, short of breath. And his EF had like initially when he went underwent bypass, his EF was about 35 ish percent, 35 to 40 percent. And he came in, his EF was down to 20, 25 percent um, and uh, just cold, clammy, uh, not doing too well. Um, and it uh, was, you know, heart failure as well as like that kind of a cold, clammy heart failure uh, picture. Uh, and so uh, I was contacted by our heart failure team as well as his primary cardiologist or one of our partners, uh, Dr. Peterson. And uh, they weren't able to, he was actually sent home uh, as outpatient. Uh, he was started on a metadrine because he wasn't tolerating uh, anything. And so when he came in, the metadrine was kind of stopped, but they weren't, as you can imagine, you know, add any medicines whatsoever. Uh, so we were consulted and we felt that he's really not going to be able to tolerate anything till we actually fixed his mitral valve. And so the thought process was, should we do something initially, uh, try to uptitrate him, put him on a balloon pump and, or an impella or mechanical support, try to titrate his medication, then go from there or do, you know, fix the mitral valve. And so digging deep into his history, he had like a mitral valve problem going on for a long time. It was just never severe. So this wasn't like new to him that he developed. Like if you talk to the patient, he said that he'd known about a kind of a mild to moderate mitral valve issue. So there was like this combination of this mixed uh, picture uh, that was there both primary and functional kind of going on for a long time. So we felt that, you know, just kind of doing uh, GDMT with just managing his cardiogenic shock is not going to fix his mitral valve. And so the combined multidisciplinary decision was that you have to do something to the mitral valve. And looking at him with his picture, we felt that just, you know, with his EF that had dropped further down to 20-ish and that's 20 being a high number, 15 to 20 percent, uh, we felt that it was probably wouldn't be safe because as you, as you already know, once you fix the mitral valve, you take away that uh, you know, you kind of increase your afterload, your EF is further going to drop, and we felt that he's again going to struggle uh, post mitral clip, and so he needed some sort of backup uh, to carry him through the procedure, as well as, you know, kind of help him kind of um, do well after the procedure to help optimize him after the procedure. So we decided to go with, you know, like you said, mechanically supported, impella supported mitral clip at that point in time. And tell me, Sid, how did you and, you know, we have a great heart team and we have a, a great set of advanced heart failure physicians who work on our patients that uh, help us kind of get through these things. How did you guys decide on what degree or what level of mechanical support to give him? Yeah, I mean, you know, at this time, you, uh, mostly, you know, what I decide between is like, you know, I think a, a balloon pump or an impella. I mean, obviously, you can go tandem support and higher support. So I think, you know, I felt that the balloon pump was going to be inadequate amount of support for this low of an EF for a guy who's not able to tolerate. So like he had all the risk factors, right? He was cold, kind of clammy, very short of breath, just not able, fully orthopnic, 
sitting up, uh, sleeping for the last few days while he was waiting for you know us to make a decision uh, on on whether uh, you know we're gonna go, which way are we gonna go, and trying to you know add different medications to him. So really looking clinically bad, as well as you know low EF, uh, which was expected to be lower afterwards as well. Yeah. So I think you know he needed a higher level of support, and I think the balloon pump was just going to be inadequate for uh, for providing that level of support for him. Yeah, I think that makes sense. You know, I don't do this stuff. I, I leave it to you guys and sort of just watch and, and wonder. But, um, you know, we do take care of shock patients, especially in PCI. And I, I hear you on that. I, I don't, I'm not sure a balloon pump is, I don't, I'm not sure a balloon pump is, is good in cardiogenic shock other than maybe the outside sort of smoldering, massively dilated heart that doesn't have valvular or ischemic disease if you're just trying to get somewhere. But that makes sense to me. Go ahead and walk us through what we're what we're going to do now. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you're kind of looking at his his mitral mitral valve at this point. Like this is like the baseline. Um, we're looking, you know, explain off the commercial view and the outflow view, which is not. And I'll show you some more pictures um, of um, kind of as we're walking through it, and then you'll see basically, you know, severe or if torrential mitral regurgitation. You know that your MR is bad if I could read your echocardiogram. Yeah. So, so really, really, you know, uh, bad mitral regurgitation of 3D view, and then you'll see it's just basically regurgitating through the entire orifice um, at this point of time. I'll just kind of show you, and uh, obviously uh, our colleague Sonny is like uh, got in a million images because, you know, he's like looking at this MR that is just, uh, you know, um, the absolute torrential. kind of torrential, and you can see the systolic flow reversals here uh, in his pulmonary veins as well. And then, kind of going forward, and you know, it's might or might not be evident on it. So I think you know the, the anesthesiologist at this point was kind of pretty concerned. He was under his, you can see his heart rate is like 105, 110, like all the way up to 120 beats per minute, which is again kind of giving you an idea. He's very tachycardic, you know, shocky. One thing that I would have done if I had done differently in this procedure, I would have kind of put a swan in to get our numbers because I'm pretty sure I would have been able to show like what the impella did and what the mitral click evidently did afterwards. Yeah. Um, and so that would have been really, really nice. I have some of the, the heart numbers that I'll show, you know, after, before, after the mitral clip. But like this guy, it, as soon as we at least put an impella, even Sonny goes, is like, hey, his, his MR looks a little bit better, not a whole lot better, a little bit better. And his heart seems a little bit more relaxed at this point of time. And this was evident. And then his, his pressure requirements went down because once he got, he wasn't on any pressors. We hadn't started him on any inotropes. But once he went under anesthesia, he was already on Leva. He was already on like, you know, uh, uh, dibutamine at that point in time, anesthesiologist was managing. He was kind of a little struggling. He was like getting more tachycardic at this point of time. And as soon as we put the impella in, every, everyone in the room kind of relaxed at that point, including our anesthesiologist, which you know how important it is for an anesthesiologist yeah. to be relaxed. Uh, and so after that, it was kind of very smooth sailing. Um, so here, like, you know, the good thing about a TEE is like I was telling Sonny's dude, like, hey, make sure my my impella is free of all the thing. It was like really nice to just kind of have him um, guide us uh, through the procedure. So again, bear with me as I look through these million images yeah. to make sure that I show you the, the right images. So the, here's this us, us doing transeptal. Um, but before that, we put the impella in which you might or might not be able to see at this point. This is not him undergoing cardioversion. Uh, but you can see right there. So he's yeah, cutting through it, right? Do you see the yep. X and the C, which is make. Uh -huh. Sid, how much more difficult, I mean, you're going to, maybe you're going to get to it in a second, if, if you are, forgive me. How much more difficult was this to do from a technical standpoint because you had this other mechanical device that's taking up space where you kind of need to be able to work somewhat freely? To, to do your job. Obviously, I don't do mitral clips with you, but I, any, I can kind of imagine that this was not as easy as doing it on an average person who doesn't have a bunch of stuff sitting in the ventricle. Yeah, no, I, I think you just have to be careful, Chris. It's a point, it's a valid point that we used to think, but I, you know, having done a, a fair number of these, it's like almost like this, you know, that you don't really care about it as much. You know, I think it's, it's one of those things where if people haven't done a whole lot of mitral clips, they want to be careful and not going too deep and interacting with an impella. But I think it's become like second nature for us where we've done people, um, uh, 
people on in cardiogenic shock on Impella for some other reasons rather than me putting in an Impella for this reason and kind of helping myself out that we've kind of now known that as long as you're not navigating the clip too deep down, uh, we kind of looked into this, make sure that our, our you know, here uh, that uh, you're basically, as you can see, you know, you, you saw before my my impella was not the impella, but the the you know this is the pigtail was kind of kind of trapped inside those pap muscles right there, and now uh, that you know I moved it out so that you know it was kind of away from you know right here. Again, I'm trying to make sure that I'm kind of trying to do this that it comes straight down, but now you can see it's kind of going up. So I eventually, uh, over a period of time, uh, got it down uh, where my impella was down towards the apex and not kind of going into the into the pap muscle. So I think the T was helpful for me for placement where I felt that, hey, my uh, my pigtail initially at the placement was free of the things, which we normally don't do. But again, for your question, because I was going to do a clip, I wanted to make sure that my impella was nice and deep and down at the apex and not like interacting with the pap muscles and somehow not making my my uh, MR actually worse um and uh, and so on and so forth so i think doing that kind of helped me in the in the at the end and i'll show you the images that when i do the clip you're not going to notice that impella is even there right um so again this is the mr now as you can imagine the uh, impella is already there and so this is us trying to do the clip right here and you can see the impella is like nowhere uh, in the vicinity and once we get down and you can see right there, right? So I'm not, I'm not gonna go too deep down in the ventricle. I'm gonna stay up here, and you can see there's like, you know, really nothing uh, that I'm gonna compete with. You can yeah. see the impella outflow right here, but I'm kind of far off. And as long as it's kind of going down, uh, we're far away from it. So it, it actually never posed a, a problem uh, for us. And so eventually, the other thing with this guy is like, you know, this guy, as you can see, he had settled down into the 90s after the impella was in, where he was like all the way in 110, 120s. Is you know the combination of both his heart getting a little relaxed and also allowing um, the anesthesiologist to back off on a little bit of that, you know, uh, epi slash uh, inotropic sure. tropic support. Take that rocket fuel down a notch. Yeah, yeah. And so finally, we did the mitral clip. We did you know one mitral clip, um, and I'll show you the final results. We had to move this kind of left and right a little bit. Again, with this, we had a combination of where we didn't want too high of a gradient. Uh, and or we weren't interacting with the cores because you can see like, you know, what initially when we put the, the thing, you still have some leak going around. And so we wanted we had a different combinations of where we wanted to put the clip in. And um, and so this was our final result after we, you know, you can see good. that. Yeah. And so we put it in a little bit medial to the center. And which kind of gave us the best results. So you saw this. This is the final 3D image of. Uh... That's that's ridiculously good. I mean, again, if you start with MR that I know how to grade as severe, and you end with MR that I can grade as uh, not even relevant, then you know you've put in a pretty good mitral clip because you and I both know I don't know how to read Neko. So. Oh yeah, we're we're in this. <laughs> pretty good. But, but so, and here's like some cath images. Um, and so you, you see there right here, like, you know, this is something that I learned from you. I always do like, you know, make sure we are at the right outflow and you can see you know, like, you know, right down at the apex and you can see like, you're not really interacting with the whole, uh, you know, while it's you're trying to go when you're working. Yeah. And so you're kind of nice in a way. Um, and, uh, you know, this is us releasing the clip here at this point and kind of backing off. Uh, and so you can, you know, this, uh, and so for this, you know, I did, did do some of the things with the impella, we left the impella in. So I think, you know, the two reasons I wanted to put it in, uh, one I said before is, is to make sure that the procedure went smooth and we didn't have like any hemodynamic issues. Uh, and, and this was one procedure where I felt like even when, before I started doing the clip, everything was very calm and very controlled. Um, and then after that, and he really didn't need the impella at that point of time. My anesthesiologist was like, are we, are we sure we're going to leave this in? This looks so good. And the one thing that I did was I really, I, I, I backed off the impella to all the way to P2. We waited for like almost 10 minutes on it. 
make sure the MR. So the results actually you saw on the 3D was at you know 10 minutes of P2 support and took oh, it off so auto. Um, not and, even not unloaded. Anymore. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we completely took it off. We made sure LA pressure, everything looked fine because we didn't want to get get fooled by the results. Um, and at that point, the anesthesiologist, well, do we need it anymore at this point? Like, should, why are we leaving it in? Like the guy looks great now, and I'm off all support. And so the reason I left it in was twofold. With the same thing that sometimes we make a mistake of like backing off on uh, on PCIs and like you know, uh, cardiogenic shock patients. Um, and again, we don't have a whole lot of data on this, but I felt from the same perspective that I discussed with our ACS heart failure team that we're going to leave this in. We're going to give you 24 to 48 hours to really optimize this guy, start him on GDMT, which we've been failing to do that. Um, and then, you know, get him on some inotropic support, start, you know, getting that up and then start weaning this off when you feel when we've done a lactase, when we've done all, all our tests. Um, so at this point, you know, again on P, so we didn't go all the way up to auto. We, uh, you know, decided P4, P5 is where we where we stabilized him at uh, and left him there. Uh, and his uh, V wave at that support was down like, uh, you know, before uh, on full support auto, his V wave was all the way up to 34, 37. And then when we left the room, his, his V wave was all the way down to like 10, 12. Uh, and so and that was on P4, less support as well. His RA pressures were like, you know, five uh, to six at that point of time. And he got a, you know, we uh, got him back in, uh, uh, not the next day, but the day after to get a right heart cath before we took the impella out and everything like that. And his, he's maintaining, he was maintaining his pressures, everything looked good. And he was like, well optimized, didn't need a whole lot of diuresis uh, after that. Um, and uh, we were able to take the impella out in less than 48 hours. After that, uh, he was started on his GDMT, um, and he remi he got actually uh, uh, by VICD as well. And so we went a little bit the other way route, uh, discussed with his family, discussed with heart failure, whether we should wait it out. But we felt that, you know, with his EF being the way it was and stuff, sure. he should get a by VICD. So he's out of the hospital now. Uh, he's back home. Uh, he got his by VICD, got started on his uh, blood there. I, I'm sorry, not blood therapy, but it's GDMT uh, mm -hmm. medications, and uh, we'll we'll see how he does. Well, that's an awesome case, man, and a really a tremendous, almost ridiculously good result. Um, and a, I think a unique way to think about hemodynamics and or using support. I don't think we see. I mean, I see this from you and from our partner Samir, but you know, uh, the pl other places I had been, I had not seen this to this degree. And I didn't, I haven't, I didn't seen the sort of degree of creativity that you guys have had to help our patients get through sort of their times of extremis. So I just wanted to kind of bring that to light and kind of show this, I'll let you show this case to everybody and, you know, give other people on murmur and other fe the fellows on murmur and other people ideas of ways that they can help address their patients in other places. So thank you so much for presenting this and thanks. Uh, thanks for giving us a chat and um, we'll uh, see everybody on the next video. Thanks guys. Yeah, thanks. Cheers.